Muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a GIF 2014. Les presento a Roger Corman. Please tell us about your beginnings uh, as a messenger at 20th Century Fox. What was it like back then? I had uh, graduated from my university, Stanford, in the United States as an engineering major. But while I was at uh, the school, I became the film critic of the Stanford Daily. And although I took my degree in engineering, I knew I wanted to make films. But uh, I couldn't get a job. The studios were very highly unionized. I wasn't a member of a union, so the only job I could get was as a messenger, riding a bike around the studio lot, delivering the mail. Um, I was essentially the failure of the uh, engineering class that year at Stanford. I got the worst job of any graduate. And then how did you make your way into 20th Century Fox? At that time, the studios were shooting six days a week, uh, but the uh, offices uh, and administration of the studio worked five days a week, and I offered to work a sixth day for nothing if I could be a messenger on the set. And uh, the head of the messenger department said, why not? Uh, so I worked uh, the sixth day, and I watched how films were being made, and. Uh, they thought that uh, this was part of my plan. They thought that I was very enthusiastic because I was working the sixth day and I was promoted to being a story analyst, which is really just a reader in the story department where uh, when scripts or novels or short stories or whatever were submitted, they had about half a dozen or a little bit more than that readers uh, writing uh, synopses and giving comments on them for the producers uh, to look over and make their decisions. And these, these scripts kept coming, and I understand that not many of them are very good until one of them caught your eye. Uh, the uh, story editor called me in after I'd been there a few months, and he said, Roger, you have never given a good uh, report on any script we've ever uh, asked you to read. And I said, that's because I'm the youngest guy in the department. You give me all the worst scripts. I'm not going to say a bad script is a good script. So they finally started giving me uh, somewhat better uh, scripts. And uh, there was a script come, that came in called The Big Gun. Uh, and I knew that uh, from what the story editor had said, that, that they had a commitment with Gregory Peck and they wanted to make a Western with him. And I liked that script very much. So I wrote uh, not only comments, but suggestions as to uh, how it might be improved. They bought the script. It became The Gunfighter with Gregory Peck, which was, has become a classic Western. And then what motivated you to leave this? The uh, story editor got a bonus for the work I did, and uh, I had been in the Navy, and uh, in the United States, if you'd been in the service, you could go to a university or any trade school, technical school or whatever, and the government would pay your tuition. So I applied, I'd already graduated from Stanford, and I applied to Oxford in England, and was accepted, really because I just wanted to go to Europe, and by going to school in Europe, the government would pay for it, and uh, that's how I went to Europe. So then you set off on your own, and did you raise money to make your first film, or how did you go about it? When I came back, um, I had met, um, from being in the story department at Fox, a number of literary agents, and uh, 
I looked around, I got a job as an assistant to one of them, and I started writing scripts on my own and uh, under a different name. And as an assistant to this agent, the agency sold my script, and I uh, made a deal with the producer to do what I had done uh, when I was a messenger. I said, I'll, I will work for you for nothing as your assistant uh, if you'll give me an associate producer credit. And he said, why not? And uh, I did. So I learned a little bit about the production of low-budget films. And also, I now had an official credit as a writer for writing the script and as an associate producer. And in Hollywood, credits are very important. Uh, so I took the money from the sale of the script, borrowed some money from various friends of mine, and for $12,000 in cash and some deferments, I made my first film. And you seem to have some insight already about, at this very early age, about how the system worked. W did you have a mentor or was someone giving you tips that's saying, you know, try to get a producer credit or try to get noticed? Or? There was no mentor. I was making it up as I went along. <laughs> I'm still making it up as I go along. Pretty crafty. Um, so you had success with this first film that you sold, um, produced and, and sold. Uh, the, a series of successes le led you to uh, James Nicholson and uh, Samuel Arkoff at AIP. Uh, what was your experience working with them? Uh, they were a new company. I had sold my first film to a small distribution company called Lippert, and the sales manager of Lippert was Jim Nicholson. So when I made my second picture, which was called The Fast and the Furious, incidentally, I made money twice off that film. The film itself was successful, and a few years ago, I sold the title to Universal, and they've had even more success with The Fast and the Furious than I had. But uh, Jim and Sam wanted to start a new distribution company, and uh, they raised me some money and made me an offer to uh, start American International with The Fast and the Furious. And what was the dynamic there? They gave you free reign, or how did you go? Well, I, the film was actually a fairly good uh, picture. It was a, a road racing film, and um, I had offers from a number of small uh, distributors, but I could see the trap uh, is that you made a film, and then you waited for the money to come back on the film before you could start another one. So I said to Jim and Sam, I will, who had never distributed a film, and this was a brand new company with no films, I said, if you, with your backers, um, can work this out, and what I said, what I want is a three-picture deal. Uh, I want the negative cost of the picture back when I turn it over to you, and then a share of the profits. And uh, that way, each time I made a film, which I made with my own money, I got the money back immediately uh, and then was able to start another film and I would wait for the profits. And this worked out to be uh, a very good arrangement uh, for me and for American International. <clears throat> and I told you that uh, we recently, this week, we had a 48-hour collegiate production rally where nine university teams competed to shoot a short film in 48 hours. Can you tell me a little bit about your own personal production record? Uh, most of the films I made when I started uh, were shot on 10-day schedules, two weeks. That was sort of the standard for low-budget pictures at that time. But uh, I, when I made Little Shop of Horrors, I made it almost uh, at partially as a bet and partially just as a joke to see if I could do it, I uh, shot it in two days plus a, a night of, uh, of uh, second unit shooting. Uh, I remember Bob Town, who was a good friend of mine, who's gone on to be an Academy Award winning screenwriter, said to me when the picture was finished, Roger, you must remember, making a film is not a horse race. It's not how fast you go. And I said, you're absolutely right, Bob. I'll never make a picture in two days again. And I never did. 
you had a lot of success with the horror genre, with science fiction, with uh, westerns. And then you decided to take a departure from all that and you took on some very serious subject matter, the theme of racial integration in the film The Intruder, which we saw last night. Can you tell me what was your primary motivation for doing this film? I was very much uh, in favor of racial integration. The north of the United States was pretty much integrated. It wasn't perfect, uh, but blacks and whites went to the same schools, the same hospitals, uh, used the same facilities. The south was very heavily segregated, and uh, uh, they had recently, Congress had recently passed a law that the schools in the south had to be integrated and it was just starting and there was beginning to be violence and I felt I wanted to make a picture on this subject. I thought it was a very important subject and uh, a film should be made on it. And what was the result of the film? How, how did it screen? How was it received? The film was received very well. Uh, my brother produced it and I directed it. We shot it in three weeks in the South with a new young actor who had just come out. He'd been on Broadway, Bill Shatner, William Shatner, who played the lead. Um, the, it went to the Venice Film Festival, a number of other festivals. It won a couple of uh, minor festivals. The reviews were wonderful. One of them I can still remember. I'll give you just a moment here. Uh, it said, uh, the intruder is a major credit to the entire American film industry. It was the first film I ever made that lost money. So was this movie a turning point in your career? It probably was. If the intruder had been successful, I probably would have continued along that vein. The fact that it was not successful made me rethink uh, what I was doing. I felt, to a certain extent, maybe I was lecturing to the audience and not entertaining them. To another extent, maybe it was just a film that they didn't want to see, people did not want uh, to hear or see anything about integration. But so I changed my style, and uh, I was studying method acting at the time, and uh, in method acting, you're taught to work with the text and the subtext. The text is the surface, what the script says, what the picture is about, or the play, as it may be. The subtext is the meaning underneath that surface. So what I decided from then on in would be that my films on the surface would be an entertainment. Beneath the surface, the subtext, would be a subject matter or a theme or a thought that was important to me. Uh, that was how I made most of my films. Not all of them. Many of them were just straight, uh, pure entertainment. There was no particular uh, theme underlying it. At this stage in your career, would you take a chance on an equally controversial film like The Intruder? I probably would. Uh, if I had a little bit of protection, a little bit of a pre-sale uh, somewhere, uh, even without that, I might do what I did with the intruder, is just make the film. But uh, there's a difference between when I made that film in 1960 and today. At that time, a low-budget film could get a full theatrical release in the United States and around the world. Today, the major studios dominate so much that it's very difficult for a low budget or even a medium budget picture to get a full theatrical release. We're primarily uh, making a film, making films for DVD and for television. For us, the cable channels more than the over the air established channels. And looking back on the era of uh, American International Pictures, what, what was your favorite film from this era? Do you have a favorite? I've been asked that a couple of times. <laughs> I have no particular favorite. I might pick a couple. Uh, maybe Mask of the Red Death, one of the Edgar Allan Poe pictures. Maybe X, The Man with X-Ray Eyes, which was a science fiction film uh, that I liked very much. So you ended your relationship with American International. 
why did you decide to break off again on your own and start a, a company called New World Pictures? I had uh, been making the Edgar Allan Poe pictures and uh, other films that were period films where were shot in the studio and I just wanted to get away from the shooting in a studio and uh, go out in the world and shoot uh, films going a little bit back to The Intruder, but on uh, what I thought would be more popular subjects. Uh, this was the 1960s, and I wanted to deal with uh, the upheaval in the culture at that time. So I made a picture called The Wild Angels, which was the first of the Hells Angels biker film. It was the opening night film at the Venice Film Festival, and it was very controversial. Uh, some critics praised it as an examination of uh, pop culture in the United States. Others condemned it for glorifying what they thought was the violence in the United States, but it was a huge success. And uh, American International did two things. They made a couple of cuts in the film that in retrospect probably weren't that uh, important, but I felt hurt the film and uh, they manipulated the books. The film was the most, uh, most uh, successful film they had ever had and somebody said it was the most successful low budget film ever made and I felt I didn't get my uh, fair share of the profits. I then, however, made another film for them called The Trip, uh, which was about an LSD trip, and uh, that was the only American film invited to the Cannes Film Festival that year, and they made a lot of cuts in, uh, in the trip, and again, um, I felt my share of the profits were not correct, and I said, enough of this, I'm gonna start my own company so they can't do this to me. So you started New World Pictures, and after having already directed 100 films, you took a back seat to directing, and you were focusing mostly on uh, producing and distributing. What was the reason for that? Well, originally I had not planned to stop directing. I thought I would stop directing for a year and come back, but New World got off to an incredible start. We released three films that I produced, and had various young directors uh, direct for me, and they were all very successful. And suddenly we had this uh, sort of booming, low-budget uh, production and distribution company, and I just didn't go back to directing. I stayed running the company. Because directing is just too time-consuming, and it's easier to produce many films at once, or what is the reasoning? It was partially time-consuming, but because we used to call it feeding the dinosaur. We had a distribution company and we had to make enough films to feed the distribution company so that the distribution company could succeed. You couldn't have a whole distribution staff and release just two or three films a year. We tried to release 10 to 12 films a year, generally about a film every month. And if I was making 12 films a year, um, there was no time to direct. Good reason. Um, so what were the, some of the highlights of your uh, tenure at New World Pictures? Well, we started uh, a number of young directors there, some before, Sorry about that. some before, it's okay, uh, some before and some after. It started with Francis Coppola, then uh, Peter Bogdanovich, then Irv Kirshner, and then, let me see, Marty Scorsese and Ron Howard and Jonathan Demme, and uh, I don't know how many, how many others, uh, going on to the most recent, uh, Jim Cameron. And so uh, on one level, we were working, uh, the highlights of working with that, and also uh, I decided I wanted to distribute uh, European or other art films, which was, uh, I thought they were not getting good distribution in the United States. So we ended up distributing for Fellini, Truffaut, Kurosawa, uh, Alan Rene, uh, Boker Schlondorf, a number of, uh, of what were considered to be uh, uh, the great uh, directors of that time. What was your relationship with these directors? It was very good. They were, Fellini advised me, he said, Roger, you're doing a great job. 
and distribution, but forget it, go back to directing. <laughs> but I, I never did. Uh, it was very grat grat gratifying because we were able to really get them better distribution than they'd had. They'd been either distributed by small companies that were more or less aficionados. They loved film, but they didn't have the strength as a distribution company to get good bookings on the right terms in the best theaters, or they were distributed by the major studios, who are wonderful distributors, but distributors for major studio type films, and they didn't really understand uh, the individual attention the films had to have. And we were really, at that time, probably the strongest independent distributors, but we were still small in comparison to the majors, so we were able to get good bookings and uh, do well by the films, and at the same time give them individual attention. And beyond the, the business side of it and the, the distribution side of it, did you have a personal relationship with Fellini and, and these other directors? Uh, I became friends, uh, not great friends, but with Truffaut and, uh, uh, and, a, and a couple of the others, but uh, the, there was, it was not really that great a, a, a personal relationship. And of the actors that you've worked with, and we can name a few, Vincent Price, Ray Milan, Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro, Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, Bruce Dern, if not all, well, almost all, with the exception of the first two, had their first films with you. What was the most uh, uh, enriching or uh, acting relationship? Which one did you enjoy the most? It's hard to say. Probably Vincent Price, because I did so many films with him. But uh, I had a very good experience with Bill Shatner. It was his first film uh, as an actor. As I say, he had gone, uh, he'd uh, been a Broadway actor before that. But then we had a number of other films. As a matter of fact, the first actor I worked with who became a star was Charlie Bronson, who uh, did a little picture called Machine Gun Kelly for me that did well in the United States but was a big success in Europe. And Charlie went to Europe the same, a similar way that Clint Eastwood did and became a star in Europe before he came back to the United States. And who was your most difficult acting relationship with? I don't think I ever had a really a difficult relationship with an actor uh, because I like to talk with the actors before shooting and go over the character and decide on the character's motivation, uh, relationship to other, other actors. And once that was established, I gave the actors a great deal of freedom on the set. So uh, occasionally there would be small difficulties, but I never had really major difficulties. And I know, I, I know you had a strategy for making films. You would make them uh, three in a row using the same actors, may, many times using the same sets, and you would have actors locked in for like multiple uh, contracts or multiple films. Could you describe some, some of these situations and some of the advantages and p perhaps difficulties that you experienced? I, I never had an actual multiple picture contract with actors, but I did build up sort of uh, an informal acting uh, group in which uh, a number of actors, Jack Nicholson, Dick Miller, and Vincent Price on a, a different level, uh, work with me from film to film. Okay. Someone, someone occurred to me right now. But um, your most, uh, of all the directors who had their first film with you, and you, you mentioned them all right now, uh, who do you think was the best out of the gate? I've been asked questions like that before. I never answer them. <laughs> no? <laughs> They're all good. I want to <laughs> pick one over the other. Okay. You, uh, you recounted a, an interesting um, story about Ron Howard and his first experience would you mind sharing with the audience? Ron Howard did a, car ra a comedy car racing picture for us called Eat My Dust. And uh, uh, it's normal to open a picture on a Friday night. And you get your grosses from the theaters. Uh, actually, you get them. I used to 
get them Friday night from certain key theaters, but by Monday morning, you would have the results everywhere, and you would know where you stood. And Eat My Dust was one of the biggest successes we had ever had. And I called Ron, who had a percentage of the profits, and told him uh, that how big the, uh, the picture was. And he said, I already know how big the picture is. I've been waiting for your call. I assume you want to do a sequel. And I said, yes. He said, I'll be right there. And he came in and he said, it's customary for the star of a picture that is done well to ask for more money. But I won't ask for any more money. I'll do, I'll do the picture for exactly the same deal as the first picture, and I'll do one other job for nothing. And I said, what is that, Ron? And Ron said, I'll direct the picture. And I said, Ron, you always look like a director to me. I knew he had gone to the SE film school and had some background, at least as a student, in directing. The picture he made was Grand Theft Auto, and just as The Fast and the Furious, uh, we scored two times, one on making the film and then uh, on selling the rights. Um, Grand Theft Auto um, was very successful, and uh, I sued the video game company, and they settled out of court, so we settled twice. We uh, scored twice on Grand Theft Auto. Uh, I recall uh, the actor I was trying to think of is Boris Karloff in Targets, I understand he owed some time to you, or had some sort of, he's like an indentured? It, it was very complicated. It's, it's too complicated okay. to, to get in to here to take most of the morning. But at any rate, uh, to settle some problems, he agreed uh, to work, I think, something like three days additional in uh, another picture for me. And Peter Bogdanovich was my assistant. And I said to Peter, if you can think of a film uh, where Boris can be the star, but he only works three days, and somebody else comes in to really carry the film. And uh, that was Peter's first film, Targets, which was a, a really very, very good film. But it had to do with uh, uh, Boris had made a, a horror film, and uh, it was showing at a drive-in where he was making a personal appearance, and uh, a slightly deranged young man was on the top of the screen, was shooting people in the audience, and uh, at the same, uh, just after Paramount bought the film from us, there was a true story of somebody who climbed to the top of a tower at the University of Texas and was shooting students. And uh, Paramount got very frightened of that. And uh, they didn't give the film a, a full release. So, les recomiendo que busquen esa película Targets de Peter Boganovich. Uh, what's the most common mistake of a first time director? I think the most common mistake, uh, and there many mistakes uh, they've made, I've made, we've all made. I think the most common mistake is not spending enough time in pre-production planning. I talk to all the, the new young directors who work with me and emphasize uh, the importance of planning as much as you can of the picture before you start shooting. It's important to do so on all films, but on particularly on low budget films where you have uh, a limited budget and a limited schedule. You want to make as many decisions as you can before you start shooting so that during the shooting schedule you're simply carrying out your plan, knowing that you will always vary from the plan a little bit. Uh, problems come up, something you plan to do you're unable to do, or maybe you get a better idea, but at least if you have it pretty much planned out, you're working uh, from a prearranged uh, uh, plan. Looking, looking back on your career, is there anything in particular that you're most proud of? Not particularly. All I can say is the fact, oh, I would say this, that um, I tried my best on every film. Um, I, I knew directors when I was first starting who said, well, this is just a cheap assignment. Uh, 
it's not important, but I need the money. I'm going to, as it were, take the money and run. I'm just going to knock this picture off. Uh, on the other hand, you can be like Jonathan Demme, whose first picture was uh, we had some success with some women in prison exploitation films, and his first film was a woman in, uh, in prison picture, and he said, I'm going to make the best woman in prison picture ever made. That is the attitude uh, that you go forward with. The other directors who said, I'm just going to knock it off because it's a, a nothing project, uh, they're the ones who are no longer directors. So you had the opportunity to produce Easy Rider at one point. What other highly successful films that you could have participated in but didn't for whatever reason? Well, Easy Rider is probably uh, uh, the biggest example of that. Uh, it, uh, it starred Peter Fonda and uh, Dennis Hopper and Jack Nicholson, all who had worked with me, particularly on uh, the trip and uh, the uh, Young of the Wild Angels. And uh, originally it was going to be done uh, for American International, who had provided the uh, distribution and the financing for those films. But it was going to be Dennis's first film. And um, Peter was going to be, uh, they, they co-wrote the script, Peter would produce, Dennis would direct, I would be executive producer and sort of run the operation because neither one of them had really produced or directed. And uh, one of the executives in a meeting at American International said, all right, we will go ahead, but uh, if Dennis falls more than one day behind schedule, we want the right to replace him. And I could see the look on Dennis and Peter's face and after the meeting, I said to that executive, you are right to worry a little bit about Dennis, but I'm going to be there. And he's worked with me, and I know he has a reputation for uh, being a little erratic, but he's worked very well with me, and I'm positive he can do this film. But uh, uh, Columbia Pictures heard about the project and heard that Peter and Dennis were unhappy, and the project went from AIP to Columbia, and they lo and if the Wild Angels was a big success, Easy Rider was a bigger success, and that executive lost the picture for AIP and, and for me. And were there any other examples like this over the years? That's really the primary example. Uh, which of the people that we, we've mentioned that you worked with in the past, are you still in touch with today and that you see on a regular basis? I'm still in touch with uh, uh, many of them, uh, Jonathan Demme and Jack Nicholson and a number of others. Uh, with others, our paths uh, diverge, but I think, or at least I would hope, I'm, I'm still on go good terms with them. What's been the biggest change from your perspective in the film industry in the last 60 years? There are two changes that are major. One is the movement from film to digital. Uh, it's much easier and less expensive to shoot digitally. And also, uh, the other changes in the equipment, the, uh, the lighting, the grip equipment, the sound equipment, the, and the cameras, everything are lighter, are lighter and more portable. So it's easier uh, and in some ways more efficient to shoot a film today than it's ever been in the past. On the other hand, distribution, so production has changed from the better, for the better. Distribution has changed for the independence for the worst. Because as I said when I started, all of our films got a full theatrical release. Today, the major studios with their 100 and 200 million dollar films and so forth dominate uh, theatrical distribution so much that the independents are pretty much uh, frozen out. Every now and then, one low budget film, generally a horror film, but there could be other genres, will get a theatrical release. But you can't really uh, sustain a company thinking uh, that you can make independent films and get regular theatrical release. And in general, have, have these 
change has been positive or negative for the industry, do you think? The change in production has been positive. The change in distribution, at least for the independents, has, has been negative. However, mm -hmm. uh, I have been predicting this for some time, and I think it's beginning to happen. A couple of these big budget films costing a couple hundred million dollars are failing, and I think there will be uh, an opening. The studios may uh, retrench a little bit on, uh, you know, Surf of Superman 18, and that may uh, open the, uh, the doors for at least a little bit more distribution for the independents. And the advent of digital, do you think it's positive or negative? Yeah, from a production standpoint, I think it's absolutely positive. You can shoot faster, easier, more efficiently. Uh, from the creative standpoint, it's debatable. Some people uh, prefer the look of film, and they would say digital uh, is not as good a look as film. That's questionable. Uh, by my count, in 2014 alone, just to now, to July, you've produced six films, as far as I know. But listening to you and your wife, Julie, it sounds like many more. How do you guys keep up this pace? Well, uh, my wife uh, produces sometimes on her own. I produce sometimes on my own. Uh, but more often, we work together on the films. So we're able to keep, and we've got our, our usual staff of uh, what we consider to up and coming young people working with us. So all together, uh, uh, we, do, we just keep making films. How big is the staff? Um, actually, it's smaller than it used to be because we make no more. I don't know if we've made six so far this year, but maybe six, including a, a couple still in production. We make no more than five, six, seven films a year now. And formerly, as I say, we used to make 10, 12, or sometimes more than that a year when we had theatrical distribution. So our staff is fairly lean. I think we've got maybe a full-time staff of, I think, 10, 11 people. And then, of course, our staff b builds up during production. And what is your role today as the producer? Has it changed over the years? No. my role as a producer is pretty much the way it's always been. Having been a director, I take very little part during the actual shooting of the picture. I believe uh, my main job as a producer is to bring all of the elements together so that the film can actually be made. I think that on the first day of shooting, when the director is able to say on the first shot, cut print and we know we have one shot in the can, that film is 75% made. I step back then during production, uh, leaving, most, leaving it to the director and the production manager. I'm on the set very little. Uh, having been a director, I want the director to be in charge. I then, so my main job is pre-production and post-production with just a little bit of supervision during the actual shooting of the film. Very good. Well, we're going to open the, the question to the audience. Uh, vamos a abrir las preguntas a la audiencia. Si nos pueden subir las luces, por favor. Y tenemos unos voluntarios con... A ver, allá ese joven en camisa negra. This is uh, Sylvester Lopez Portilla, one of our great journalists. Did you say posters? 
You're talking about posters? Yes. Posters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, from my standpoint, uh, the posters, the trailers, all the advertising and publicity material is very, very important, particularly when you're making independent or low-budget films or even medium-budget films. You can't say, uh, we've got Tom Cruise or Johnny Depp or something to sell the film on that. Or you can't be Jim Cameron and say, um, I'm selling the film on the brilliance of the special effects and so forth. Uh, so the posters are very important. I spend a lot of time and our entire staff, not the entire, but the, or the creative end of our staff, all gets together uh, on the design of the posters and uh, the cutting of the trailers and the TV spots as to the actors, and you said actresses, uh, I think that there is a little bit too much emphasis on the male leading man and not enough on uh, uh, the women. For instance, it's been talked about uh, uh, a number of actors who started uh, with me. Uh, Sandra Bullock uh, did her first lead for me, so I've always tried to give uh, actresses strong roles also. In regard to the first part, uh, in danger, yes, when we did The Intruder, uh, we got death threats. And uh, we actually uh, did not let the townspeople where we were shooting, because we only had a few actors from Hollywood. Most of the roles were played by people from the town. Um, we didn't, uh, the scripts we let them see, uh, did not include certain scenes that we felt uh, might be controversial. but. Uh, we were run out of uh, two towns by the police, and uh, we ended up shooting in three different towns as a result. Um, the second question, uh, what was the second question again? It was uh, regarding the amount of production versus the quality of production. Was it? A we. We try, not, <clears throat> we try not to sacrifice the quality of the film at any time, yet at the same time, we're aware that if we have uh, a small budget, as we generally do, we're not going to be able to make an Avatar or something like that. We try to design our scripts so that they don't require uh, giant special effects or big crowd scenes or so forth so that we can um, do the best possible job we can in relationship to the budget. And we try to stay, and generally we're successful in that, we stay very close to our budgets. Uh, <clears throat> Um, 
First, we talked to the directors and their producers about acquiring the American rights. The way we normally distributed that type of film, we did not go wide the way you do now with uh, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 prints. We would generally open in New York and Los Angeles in certain theaters which were known to uh, uh, play that type of film. And we would be very heavilent upon, uh, uh, very uh, dependent on uh, the reviews and of course the grosses in those theaters. So as I say, we were generally open in New York and Los Angeles and then dependent upon the reviews and how, uh, how much money the picture did. We would slowly expand to the major cities around the country. Uh, we would generally not even bother to play the picture in most rural areas because we knew the, uh, the audience was not there. One place, however, small towns where the audience was there was in uh, university towns. For instance, in uh, where I was born in Detroit. Uh, if we opened the picture in Detroit, we would open it also in an cities you've probably never heard of, Ann Arbor and Lansing, because the University of Michigan is in Ann Arbor and Michigan State University is in Lansing. And we found that those small university towns did very well for that type of film because the university students wanted to see them. I could even give you another example where I went to Stanford, which is just outside of San Francisco. When we opened in San Francisco, we would open in San Francisco, in Palo Alto, where Stanford is located, and in Berkeley, where the University of California is located. So that would be our general pattern for that type of film. Atrás. When I, f I produced my first film, um, I, I produced it for $12,000 plus some deferments, and uh, we shot it in six days. And uh, the way I was able to do that was I paid each person a small amount of money and gave them a percentage of the profits. So everybody was working um, not only for the money, but primarily for the profits and for the, the opportunity to work on a film. And everybody did many jobs. Uh, for instance, I, drove, I was the producer. I also drove the grip truck. And I remember the head of the Teamsters, which is the union uh, which handles truck drivers, came to the set and said, uh, uh, who's your truck, he came to me, I was the producer, he said, who's your truck driver? And I said, I am. And he laughed and he said, you're the first producer truck driver I've ever seen. Uh, we'll make you an honorary member of the Teamsters for one picture, but you've got to sign with us on the next picture, which I did. Sí, hacerlo y que lo pasen, lo pasen, ¿no? Yes, I'd be very much interested in producing or co-producing a Mexican film. Um, the uh, 
simply the economics, uh, the market for Mexican films or Spanish uh, language films in general is growing in uh, the United States, as you may know. The Spanish language uh, TV networks are growing faster than the English language uh, networks are growing. And I've produced films in Mexico and in various places in South America particularly uh, Argentina and Peru. So uh, I'd be happy uh, to work in Mexico. What is your perception of Mexican film? as an industry and as a product from the 60s up until now? I think the uh, Mexican film industry is producing some excellent films now. Uh, a number of Mexican directors, as you know, have become internationally known uh, directors. A number of Mexican actors uh, also. So I think the Mexican industry uh, is doing very well now. Historically, they did very well in the past. I think there was a little bit of a drop for a while, but I think it's coming back. Alguien aquí enfrente. Uh, what is your opinion on film schools? I'm a strong believer in film schools. When I started, there were only one or two film schools in the United States. I think uh, we had to learn on the job. I think film schools are very good because they allow the students to learn the technical aspects of motion pictures as well as the creative. It gives them a chance to learn by being in class and actually making student films. And it's a great way to experiment. You can take chances with a student film that you might not be able to take with a, a commercial film. So I'm strongly in favor, if possible, of people going to film schools. On the other hand, there is still the opportunity to learn uh, in the business on the set as well. Y atrás de él. What was the most fun you had on set? What was what film was the most fun? Probably when I did two very low budget pictures. I, I, may, I mentioned Little Shop of Horrors, which was a comedy horror film that I shot in two days, and Bucket of Blood, which is going to be screening later uh, today, which again was a comedy horror film that I shot in five days. Um, it was very difficult, of course, to shoot that fast, but on the other hand, the budgets were very low, and we could just sort of enjoy ourselves and have a good time making the films. And I think the fact that they were comedies as well as horror films uh, lent themselves to the fact that everybody was having a good time and the films were actually funnier uh, for that reason. ¿Como director de cine o como maestro de la nueva generación? ¿Como su legado? Well, uh, referring to your legacy as a filmmaker, what do you think is more important? Your, uh, the films that you directed as a director or uh, the fact that uh, you are a, a mentor and inspiration to so many other different filmmakers? 
I'm not really certain which is more important. Uh, when I, I got my Academy Award, it was a Lifetime Achievement Award rather than an award for any one film. And on the statue, it said something about uh, uh, engendering films and filmmakers. So it sort of recognized my work as a filmmaker and working with uh, and developing uh, and helping young filmmakers. I think of them as equally important. A catarsita de ella. As a producer, what do you look for in a film, and how do you predict its success? I look for a film uh, that can function on two levels. One is a film that interests me, and I think can be a good film, and that can also function commercially. It's uh, one thing to look at a film from a commercial standpoint, one thing to look at a film from a creative standpoint. The difficulty is trying to find films that can fit into both areas. As to predicting uh, the success, William Goldman, an Academy Award-winning award uh, writer, screenwriter, wrote a book, and in it he said, and this has been quoted many times, nobody knows anything. Uh, it's not necessarily true. I don't think you can say nobody knows anything. I think you can say that nobody has all the answers. We have general ideas. We can make what I would call an informed guess based upon what has gone before, based upon our experience, based upon we think of the individual product. We can make a reasonably accurate uh, prediction of success. You are never entirely accurate and even the most experienced and brilliant uh, producers and directors uh, have made mistakes. They've sometimes made major mistakes, and if you're good, you come back, you learn from that mistake, and you, do, you try not to do it again. Yeah, as a director, has it been easier for you to work with more budget or with less budget? Um, you have more freedom, it's been my experience, with a lower budget film. Because if you're making it for your own company, as most of my films are, there's nobody telling you what to do. And if you're making it for a bigger company or a major studio, if it's a low budget film, they don't really pay that much attention, they give you a great deal of freedom. If it's a bigger budget film, they're trying to protect their investment and they try to put controls on you and uh, sometimes uh, their decisions are wrong, but uh, they're the ones running the studio. So I uh, congratulate you for an incredible career of making hundreds of films. Uh, but one of the major problems in Mexico is that um, 
you've successfully been able to make independent films and get them produced and distributed in, in your own country and, and abroad. However, uh, Mexican filmmakers, uh, Mexican students, are faced with the problem of you know not being able to f number one find the resources to make the films, and number two, once they get the films made, it's very difficult to find uh, distribution and, and exhibition spaces uh, because our our screens, our commercial screens, are so dominated by those 120 million dollar Hollywood films that you mentioned. So what advice can you give to them in terms of getting their films out, getting their films made and getting their films out there? I think the uh, problem of getting your films made, uh, if you're willing to work with a low budget and a small crew, are not as great as they were in the past. I think it's easier to get your film made, and it's always difficult to get a film made, but comparatively it is less difficult today than it has been in the past because, as I said earlier, the lighter equipment, the digital equipment, and so forth, uh, it is more difficult to get distribution today. As you say, in Mexico, the screens are dominated by these big pictures. That's a problem all over the world. It's a particularly a big problem in the United States, but uh, I was on the jury of the Tokyo Film Festival last year and talking to some Japanese filmmakers. They have the same problem in Japan. It's a problem all over the world. Uh, so you have to face the fact that most likely you will not get a theatrical release. That doesn't mean it's impossible. It is, uh, it, it, what should I say? It's not probable, it is possible you would be the exception, but you'll be looking primarily to television, to cable television, to DVD, and so forth, and now, of course, the internet. I think you're going to see over the coming years um, fewer opportunities for theatrical release and greater opportunities for uh, distribution over the inter internet. It's not quite there yet, but I think it will be in the coming years. Uh, I want to know your opinion on CGI. Is better CGI than old way, or is better the old way than CGI? My opinion of CGI is that it is a great tool. Um, the quality of CGI is increasing steadily, and the cost um, is dropping. And for many films, uh, you're very heavy, heavily dependent upon CGI. The only uh, qualification I might make is, is this. Um, I think some filmmakers, whether they're producers or directors, whoever is making the decision, is putting too much emphasis on CGI and not enough emphasis on the story itself. I think you have to go back to the story with the characters, the characterizations, this is the basis of filmmaking. CGI should be a tool to help you do that. It should not be the raison d'etre in itself. Uh, your opinion on how they uh, rely more on CGI and uh, celebrity over a story? Uh, I uh, still insist upon the story. Uh, the CGI, no matter how good it is, is not going to carry 
a bad story. And a star, no matter how great the star, is not going to carry a bad story. As a matter of fact, I believe that the importance of stars is less than it has been in the past. Aqui em frente. Ah, pronto. Uh-huh. Okay, one second. Uh, he, uh, he's asking about the book that you published, uh, How You Made a Hundred Films Without Losing a Dime. And he wants to know if... Uh, what was the motivation behind make, writing this book? If it was uh, because, was it a manifesto or simply a memoir? ¿Qué más? ¿Es otra pregunta? ¿Y tú qué? Obsesión, no escucho la palabra. Definición de cine. Ah, okay. And your definition of film. The motivation was very simple. The publisher approached me and asked me if I would write uh, this book, and they offered me a, uh, a substantial advance for writing it, and I thought it would be an interesting project to, to write the book. Uh, the second question was, what is my definition of film? Yeah, it, well, first, if the, if the book was, was it meant as a memoir, or was it meant as a manifesto to... The book was not really a manifesto. It was really the story of uh, what had been my career in films with a little bit of uh, uh, my thoughts about film and my experience in filmmaking that I might be able to pass on uh, to some of the people who read the book. And he wants to know what your definition of film is. Well, I think film is the most important art form in the world today because I think it's the most modern. When I say film, I should say the art of the moving Im image, motion pictures. Uh, I keep talking, using the word film, everybody else does, but uh, the evidence is very clear around us uh, that the use of film is fading and digital is taking over. But I think the art of the moving image of motion pictures is the art form of today. Other art forms, whether they be plays, painting, music, novels, uh, are historically important forms, but they do not reflect the image of the world uh, the way you can with motion pictures. And I have a quick question to add to his question. Aren't you due for another memoir, How I Made 400 Films and Never Lost a Dime? Uh, I've been approached uh, to do another one. I may do it, but uh, I don't have any plans at the moment. Okay. Aquí. What does he think about what? Uh, the legacy he has imprinted in the film industry thanks to all the movies he produces, the TV he directed. Okay. Did you quite understand the question? I did. Dime en español rápido. ¿Qué piensa de su. ¿Qué piensa del legado que ha dejado en la industria del cine después de producir tantas películas? Okay. Okay, muy bien. Uh, what do you think about the fact that you've left behind this legacy of all these low-budget films that have your, your stamp upon them, uh, which are kind of like the holy grail for many other filmmakers? Uh, well, I'm pleased uh, that some of my work is being recognized, yet a lot of the things I've done, my contemporaries have been doing as well. Um, I'm simply part of the uh, motion picture making world. I hope that uh, my individual efforts can be recognized, but I'm 
really one of many. Okay. Vamos con el público. Okay. A las cuatro tenemos a uh, rueda de prensa para la prensa. ¿Cómo? Cuando Obama comenzó su carrera, el cine independiente, el cine de serie B, en específico el cine de género, por ejemplo, ficción, thriller, terror, eh, contenía una fuerte carga de elementos subversivos que buscaban renovar no solo el género, sino también dar el contenido social dentro de sus historias. Eran muy reaccionarias, eso no se buscaba. Pero hoy en día vemos que este mismo cine independiente de terror de serie B se consumo rápido, muy negativo, eh, de una dimensión francamente banal. ¿Qué opinas de esta eh, transición de la serie B? Si se perdió el espíritu subversivo. Claro. Y si se perdió, si existiría una manera de renovar la nueva. Ok. Gracias. So he says when he, when he started off doing these films, uh, sci-fi, horror, uh, there was a subversive element to the to the f to these films and what you discussed earlier with the, the subtext and the text, and he finds that today these same horror sci-fi films are very superficial and they don't go into the social aspects or the uh, yeah so there's no politics there's no subversion and he thinks that they're quite dead they're quite uh, disposable they're not uh, they're not going to last so what what is what does he think what is your opinion of this and do you think that there's any hope for rejuvenating this uh, this art form and making it deeper I think there is some truth in what you say I myself am concerned that some of our films, particularly these creature uh, films, we have a picture uh, playing today is Saturday. Tonight. We have a picture playing on the Sci Fi Channel uh, tonight in Los Angeles called Sharktopus versus Terracuda, which is a pretty wild uh, sort of creature mashup. It's a love and story. It's a love story. Oh, yes, right. Uh, uh, just as a joke, somebody talked about posters. Our posters uh, uh, show these two creatures fighting, and underneath the title it says, A Love Story. Uh, we put that in really just to let everybody know uh, we don't take this work too seriously. You could say there's some comment on the dangers of science uh, run amok, and there might be a little bit of social comment, but I wouldn't push that too heavily. I think what you're saying is, uh, is correct. Uh, there's less, uh, my films have always had, have almost always had a certain, a certain element of rebellion in them, and uh, I have several projects uh, working now, at least working in my mind, uh, that will go back to that. I'm concerned about exactly what you said. Have you, ever, have you ever considered going back to Poe and doing another Poe story that maybe was never produced? Do you ever consider going back to Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, and doing a Poe story, a Poe story that pro possibly wasn't produced? Uh, there are several Poe stories that I was thinking of doing. One of them is the narrative of A. Gordon Pym, which is uh, a little bit of a science fiction story. It was an unusual story for Poe. Uh, so uh, there is a possibility that I will go back to that particular one. Cool. Y aquí, aquí bajito en la piel.
Okay. What is the greatest advice you can give to anyone who wants to, to make film? I would give them, I would break that into two answers. One is to be aware of where the commercial market stands, yet at the same time, try to do a film that is personal to you that is that has the stamp of your thoughts on it in relationship to the commercial market. Uh, the other would be, from a practical standpoint, I, as I said, I emphasize in production the importance of pre-production planning. I think so you start with your idea and then you develop that idea as deeply uh, and as well as you can before you start shooting. You don't try to solve major problems during the shooting. You solve those problems, if you can, before shooting. Otro público, público, público. Bueno, ¿alguien más? Acá, una, acá. Es la última. I didn't catch the, the very end of that, but I understood that you've made many successful low budget films. Uh, but in, why don't you just like save 12 of these budgets and make one big budget film? <laughs> the answer is very simple. I finance my films with my own money, and I don't have that much money. <laughs> okay. Bueno, un aplauso para el señor Roger Corman. Quiero decir, quiero decir que el señor Roger Corman estaba con nosotros toda la semana y no faltó ninguna muestra de sus películas, fue a presentar todas. Entonces, uh, también un aplauso por eso. Muchas gracias. Gracias a todos. Bueno, ah, también les quiero recordar que esta noche, después de la ceremonia de premiación y clausura, la última película de Roger que vamos a mostrar en, uh, en el festival es Bucket of Blood y lo vamos a mostrar en el teatro principal a las 8 de la noche. Gracias. <tose>